Hello, 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 greetings, salutations, konnichiwa, and every other form of green across this vast, marvelous multiverse. I am Matsu Quinox. This is Horace, and welcome, 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 oh, welcome, 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 welcome once again, my dear scholars, to the study. <laughs> I hope everyone's doing well. Oh, hello there, Yulian20. Welcome. Have a jolly holly Christmas. Oh, thank you. And I see Cool Skeleton you posted earlier, too. Hello there. And hello there, Private Maverick. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am full of welcome today. Ah, oh, so how is everyone this uh, fine time, wherever you may be? Oh, hello there, Dr. Zadium. Welcome back to the study. Always good to see you here. Yulian20, full of something. I hope it's good things. Private Maverick, trying to keep warm. It's way too cold outside. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. I hope you're keeping as warm as possible. Um, a good fire is usually the answer to that. Hmm, excuse me. <laughs> Yulian 20. Cool skeleton, we have too much cold rain. Ooh, Yulian 20, blizzard-like here. Oh, 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 really? Cold rain and cold snow. Oh, that is quite a mixture. Well, as you see, we're nothing short of snow, so uh, I would offer to take what you have, but uh, I think we have plenty here, as you can probably tell. Union 20 minus 13 now. I'm guessing that's in Fahrenheit. And wow, that is cold. Well, try and stay warm as possible. And be careful. Mm, yes. It's uh, not too bad here, actually. We, uh, it's, it, it has, of course, been a little bit cold as we've been working out um, what to do with the snow room and all the snow in here. But we've managed to uh, keep ourselves as warm as possible. And um, I suppose that's it. That's all. Private Maverick, yeah, and having wind chills near minus 30 is no laughing matter. Oh my goodness. Minus 30. Wow. Wow, um, I'm glad I'm not where you are right now. No offense, of course. But wow, that is, that is, that is cold. That is bone chillingly cold. Mm. You ever wonder why they say that, bone chilling cold? I mean, I suppose it means, you know, that it chills you right down to your bones, but kind of an odd thing to say. Union 20, so keep us, keep us warm? So is that my job now, to keep you all warm? Cool Skeleton, my bones are cold. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to keep you warm tonight, given that this uh, tonight's chapter is a little bit more spine-chilling than the others. Union 20, yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm sorry to hear your bones are cold, cool skeleton. So, 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 so tonight we are continuing with our reading of A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. I hope you've been enjoying the, um, the previous streams of this. I've been having a real fun time reading it. Although... It does tend to uh, wear down my poor voice quite a bit. Dear me. Ah, so. Um, yes, so tonight we are going to be reading Chapter 4 of A Christmas Carol. You lean 20. The streams are wonderful. Oh, thank you. I do them all for you. That's what matters. So tonight we'll be continuing with Stave 4, or Chapter 4, whichever you want to call it, which concerns... um. The Ghost of Christmas Yet to Come. Or Ghost of Christmas Future, whichever you want to call it. Um, so this is going to be a shorter chapter. So we will have plenty of time to discuss it afterwards. Cool Skeleton, what's up, bro? The ceiling mostly... What, 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 what happened? What happened? Whoa, where am I? Where am I? How did I get down there? Oh! Oh, oh, whoa. Well, that's what I get for uh, looking up. I slipped off my chair. 
<laughs> That's the most embarrassing. Oh, no. Oh, no. Well, I'm not going to do that again. Oh. That's what I get for looking up, you know. You look up, and next thing you know, your your back's on the floor, and you're... Cool skeleton, you okay? Yes, I, I'm fine, I'm fine. Luckily, the, um... Luckily, I didn't have that bad of a fall. So, uh... So, yeah, no problems, no problems. I'm, I'm alright. I am perfectly fine. Thankfully. No injuries here. I'm not gonna... I don't want to hear you snickering, Horace. It wasn't funny. Okay, maybe it was a little funny, I will admit it, but it's not that funny to talk about. Okay. Alright. Is everyone ready for tonight's uh, reading? I'm ready. I mean, I've got the book right here. And I have my wonderful little drink here. I have to hydrate. Cool skeleton. Broken bones are no laughing matter, especially when all you are is bones. Yes, I suppose for you it's it's a very dangerous thing to worry about. Um, so tonight, I will warn you, this chapter is going to have a lot of outlandish voices in it that I'm going to attempt. So uh, be prepared for some very over-the-top performances from me. It, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. But uh, one of the voices, I will admit, is very, very, very over-the-top. And um, I'm not going to try to do it goofy, but I'm going to try to make it work. Cool skeleton, the life of an undead is a rough one. I suppose, I suppose. I mean, look at poor Murray. First game blown up, left as a skull. Getting smashed to bits, pulverized, flattened, shot out of a cannon, stuck to a ship. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose so. Alright, let me part the curtains. I remembered it this time. I remembered it. Ah, oh, there we are. And we'll begin our reading of A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. <coughs> Excuse me, clear my throat. Stave 4 The Last of the Spirits. The Phantom slowly, gravely, silently approached. When it came near him, Scrooge bent down upon his knee, for in the very air through which the spirit moved, it seemed to scatter gloom and mystery. It was shrouded in a deep black garment, which concealed its head, its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible, save one outstretched hand. But for this, it would have been difficult to detach its figure from the night and separate it from the darkness by which it was surrounded. Private Maverick, when you're right, so you're right. You're on your own here, folks. We'll see you at the finale. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, hello there, Crusader Corrupted. Thank you for the raid. Oh, I really have to work on getting a raid uh, warning out here somewhere. Still have to work on that. Or put that on the list of things to do. He felt that it was tall and stately when it came beside him, and that its mysterious presence filled him with a solemn dread. He knew no more, for the spirit neither spoke nor moved. I am in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come said Scrooge. The spirit answered not, but pointed onward with its hand. You are about to show me shadows of the things that have not happened, but will happen in the time before us, Scrooge pursued. Is that so, spirit? The upper portion of the garment was contracted for an instant in its folds, as if the spirit had inclined its head. That was the only answer he received. Although well used to ghostly company by this time, 
Scrooge feared the silent shape so much that his legs trembled beneath him, and he found that he could hardly stand when prepared to follow it. The spirit paused a moment, as observing his condition and giving him time to recover. But Scrooge was all the worse for this. It thrilled him with a vague, uncertain horror to know that, behind the dusky shroud, there were ghostly eyes intently fixed upon him, while he, though he stretched his own to the utmost, could see nothing but a spectral hand and one great heap of black. Cool skeleton. Well, that just seems a bit rude. <laughs> yes, indeed. <coughs> Ghost of the future, he exclaimed. I fear you more than any spectre I have seen. But as I know your purpose is to do me good, and as I, have, as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, I am prepared to bear you company, and to do it with a thankful heart. Will you not speak to me? It gave him no reply. The hand was pointed straight before them. Lead on, said Scrooge. Lead on. The night is waning fast, and it is precious time to me, I know. Lead on, spirit. The phantom moved away as it had come towards him. Scrooge followed in the shadow of its dress, which bore him up, he thought, and carried him along. They scarcely seemed to enter the city, for the city rather seemed to spring up around about spring up about them and encompass them of its own act. But there they were, in the heart of it, on change amongst the merchants, who hurried up and down, and chinked the money in their pockets, and conversed in groups, and looked at their watches, and trifled thoughtfully with their great gold seals and so forth, as Scrooge had seen them often. The spirit stopped beside one little knot of businessmen, observing that the hand was pointed to them, Scrooge advanced to listen to their talk. No, said a great fat man with a monstrous chin. I don't know much about it. Either way, I only know he's dead. What did he die? When did he die? inquired another. Last night, I believe. Why, what was the matter with him? asked the third, taking a vast quantity of snuff out of a very large snuff-box. I thought he'd never die. God knows. What has he done with his money? asked a red-faced gentleman with a pedulous excreant on the end of his nose that shook like the gills of a turkey-cock. I haven't heard, said the man with the large chin, yawning again. Left it to his company, perhaps. He hasn't left it to me, that's all I know. This pleasantry was received with a general laugh. It's likely to be a very cheap funeral, said the same speaker. For upon my life, I don't know of anybody to go to it. Suppose we make up a party and volunteer. I don't mind going, if a lunch is provided, observed the gentleman with the excreants on his nose. But I must be fed, if I make one. Another laugh. Well, I am the most disinterested among you, after all, said the first speaker. For I never wear black gloves, and I never eat lunch. But I'll have to go if anybody else will. When I come to think of it, I'm not at all sure that I wasn't his most particular friend. For we used to stop and speak whenever we met. Bye-bye. Speakers and listeners strolled away, and mixed with other groups. Scrooge knew the men, and looked towards the spirit for an explanation. The phantom glided on, to the, on into a street. Its finger pointed to two persons meeting. Scrooge listened again, thinking 
that the explanation might lie here. He knew these men also perfectly. They were men of business, very wealthy and of great importance. He had made a point always of standing well in their esteem, in a business point of view, that is, strictly in a business point of view. How are you? said one. How are you? returned the other. Well, said the first, old Scratch has got his own at last, eh? So I'm told, returned the second. Cold, isn't it? Seasonable for Christmas time. You're not a skater, I suppose. No, no, something else to think of. Good morning. Not another word. That was their meeting, their conversation, and their party. Scrooge was at first inclined to be surprised that the spirit should attach importance to conversations apparently so trivial. But feeling assured that they must have some hidden purpose, he set himself to consider what it was likely to be. They could scarcely be supposed to have been have any bearing on the death of Jacob, his old partner, for that was past, and this ghost's province was the future. Nor could he think of anyone immediately connected with himself, to whom he could apply them. But nothing doubting that to whomsoever they applied, they had some latent moral for his own improvement. He resolved to treasure up every word he heard, and everything he saw, and especially to observe the shadow of himself when it appeared. For he had an expectation that the conduct of his future self would give him the clue he missed, and would render the solution of these riddles easy. He looked about in that very place for his own image. But another man stood in his custom corner, and though the clock pointed to his usual time of day for being there, he saw no likeness of himself among the multitudes that poured in through the porch. It gave him little surprise, however, for he had been revolving in his mind a change of life, and thought and hoped he saw his newborn resolution carried out in this. Quiet and dark, beside him stood the phantom with its outstretched hand. When he roused himself from his thoughtful quest, he fancied from the turn of the hand and its situation in reference to himself that the unseen eyes were looking at him keenly. It made him shudder and feel very cold. They left the busy scene and went into an obscure part of the town where Scrooge had never penetrated before although he recognized its situation and its bad repute. The ways were foul and narrow, the shops and houses wretched, the people half-naked, drunken, slipshod, ugly, alleys and archways, like so many cesspools, disgorged their offenses of smell and dirt and life. Upon the straggling streets, and the whole quarter reeked with crime, with filth, and misery. Far in this den of infamous resort, there was a low-browed beetling shop, below a penthouse roof, where iron old rags, bottles, bones, and greasy offal were bought. Upon the floor within were piled up heaps of rusty keys, nails, chains, hinges, files, scales, weights, and refuge iron of all kinds. Secrets that few would like to scrutinize were bred and hidden in mountains of unseemly rags, masses of corrupted fat, and sulpicures, and sulpicures of bones. Sitting in among the wares he dealt in, by a charcoal stove made of old bricks, was a gray-haired rascal, nearly seventy years of age, who had screened himself from the cold air without by a frosty curtaining 
of malicious, of, sorry, of malicious, of various tatters, hung upon a line, and smoked his pipe in all the luxury of calm retirement. Scrooge and the Phantom came into the presence of this man, just as a woman with a heavy bundle slunk into the shop. But she had scarcely entered, when another woman, similarly laden, came in too, and she was closely followed by a man in faded black, who was no less startled by the sight of them than they had been upon the recognition of each other. After a short period of blank astonishment, in which the old man with the pipe had joined them, they all three burst into a laugh. And here we go with those voices, my dear scholars. Bear with me. <laughs> Embrace yourself. Here, yeah, let the charwoman alone to be the first, cried she who had entered first. Let the laundress alone to be the second, and let the undercaker's man alone to be the third. Look here, old Joe. Here's a chance, if we hadn't all three met here without meaning it. Oh, goodness. Yeah. Mm. You could have made a better place, said old Joe, removing his pipe from his mouth. Come into the parlor. You were made free of it long ago, you know. And the other two ain't strangers. Stop till I shut the door of the shop. Ah, how it squeaks. There ain't such a rusty bit of metal in the place of it as its own hinges, I believe. And I'm sure there's no such old bones here as mine. <laughs> we're all suitable to our calling. We're well matched. Come in the parlor. Come in the parlor. <laughs> The parlor was the space behind the screen of rags. The old man raked the fire together with an old stair rod, and having trimmed his smoky lamp, for it was night, with the stem of his pipe, put it in his mouth again. Oh, hello there, Kintron. Welcome. Glad to have you here. You just got to me doing some of my most difficult voices for this book as of yet. While he did this, the woman who had already spoken threw her bundle on the floor and sat down in a flaunting manner on a stool, crossing her elbows on her knees and looking with a bold defiance at the other two. What are the... Ah. What odds, then? What odds, Mrs. Dilba? said the woman. Every person has a right to take care of themselves. He always did. That's true, indeed, said the laundress. No man more so. Why, then, don't stand staring as if you were afraid, woman. Who's the wiser? We're not going to pick holes in each other's coats, I suppose. No, indeed, said Mrs. Dilber and the man together. We should hope not. Crusader Crump is still sounding very good. Thank you. This is a very difficult chapter. Very well, then, cried the woman. That's enough. Who's the worst for the loss of a few things like these? Not a dead man, I suppose. No, indeed, said Mrs. Dilber, laughing. If he wanted to keep him after he was dead, a wicked old screw, pursued the woman. Why wasn't he natural in his lifetime? If he had been, he'd have had somebody to look after him when he was struck with death, instead of lying, gasping out his last there, alone by himself. It's the truest, truest words that ever was spoken, said Mrs. Dilber. It's a judgment on him. I wish it was a little heavier one, replied the woman. And it should have been. You might depend upon it. If I could have had lay, if I could have laid my hands on anything else, open that bundle, old Joe, and let me know the value of it. Speak out plain. I'm not afraid to be the first, not afraid for them to see it. 
We know pretty well that we were helping ourselves before we met here, I believe. It's no sin. Open the bundle, Joe. But the gallantry of her friends would not allow of this, and the man in faded black, mounting the breach first, produced his plunder. It was not extensive. A seal or two, a pencil case, a pair of sleeve buttons, and a brooch of no great value, were all. They were severely examined and appraised by old Joe, who chalked the sums he was disposed to give for each upon the wall, and added them up into a total when he found there was nothing more to come. That's your account, said Joe, and I won't give another sixpence if I was to be boiled for not doing it. Who's next? Mrs. Dilbert was next. Sheets and towels, a little wearing apparel, two old-fashioned silver teaspoons, a pair of sugar tongs, and a few boots. Her account was stated on the wall in the same manner. Oh, I always give too much to ladies. It's a weakness of mine, and that's the way I ruin myself, said old Joe. That's your account. If you ask me for another penny and made it an open question, I'd repent of being so liberal and knock off half a crown. And now undo my bundle, Joe, said the first woman. Joe went down on his knees for the greater convenience of opening it, and having unfastened a great many knots, dragged out a large and heavy roll of some dark stuff. What do you call this? said Joe. Bed curtains? Ah! returned the woman, laughing and leaning forward on her cross arms. Bed curtains! You don't mean to shy. You took them down. Rings and all, with him lying there, said Joe. Yes, I do, replied the woman. Why not? Oh, you were born to make your fortune, said Joe, and you'll certainly do it. I certainly shan't hold my hand when I get anything in it by reaching it out for the sake of such a man as he was. I promise you, Joe, returned the woman coolly. Don't drop that oil upon the blankets now. His blankets? asked Joe. Who else's do you think? replied the woman. He isn't likely to take cold without him, I dare say. Hope he didn't die of anything catching, I said old Joe, stopping in his work and looking up. Don't you be afraid of that, returned the woman. I'd say so fond of his company that I'd loiter about him for such things if he did. Ah, you may look through that shirt till your eyes ache, but you won't find a hole in it, not a threadbare place. It's the best he had, and a fine one too. They'd have wasted it if it hadn't been for me. What do you call wasting of it? asked old Joe. Put it on him to be buried in, to be sure, replied the woman with a laugh. Somebody was fool enough to do it, but I took it off again. If Caligo ain't good enough for such a purpose, it isn't good enough for anything. It's quite as becoming to the body. He can't look uglier than he did in that one. Scrooge listened to this dialogue in horror. As they sat grouped about their spoil in the scanty light afforded by the old man's lamp, he viewed them with a detestation and disgust, which could hardly have been greater, though they had been obscene demons marketing the corpse itself. <laughs> Laughed the same woman when old Joe, producing a flannel bag with money in it, told out their several gains upon the ground. This is the end of it, you see. He frightened every one away from him when he was alive to profit us when he was dead. <laughs> oh. Spirit, 
said Scrooge, shuddering from head to toe. I see, I see. The case of this unhappy man might be my own. My life tends that way now. Merciful heaven! What is that? He recoiled in terror, for the scene had changed, and now he almost touched a bed, a bare, uncurtained bed, on which beneath a ragged sheet there lay a something covered up, which, though it was dumb, announced itself in awful language. The room was very dark, too dark to be observed with any accuracy, though Scrooge glanced round it in obedience to a secret impulse, anxious to know what kind of room it was. A pale light, rising in the outer air, fell straight upon the bed, and on it, plundered and bereft, Unwatched, unwept, uncared for, was the body of this man. Scrooge glanced towards the phantom. Its steady hand was pointed to the head. The cover was so carelessly adjusted that the slightest raising of it, the motion of a finger upon Scrooge's part, would have disclosed the face. He thought of it felt how easy it would be to do, and longed to do it, but had no more power to withdraw the veil than to dismiss the specter at his side. O oh, cold, cold, rigid, dreadful death, set up thine altar here, and dress it with such terrors as thou hast at thy command. For this is thy dominion, how did I get down here again? Ah! Ah! Hold on. There I am. I need to work on this chair. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, dear scholars. Ah! Where was I? Horace, do something about this chair, will you? Where was I? But of the loved, revered, and honored head, Thou cannot turn one hair to thy dread purposes, or make one feature odious. It is not that the hand is heavy, and will fall down when released. It is not that the heart and pulse are still, but that the hand was open, generous and true. The heart brave, warm and tender, and the pulse a man. Strike! Shadow strike, and see his good deeds springing from the wound to sow the world with life immortal. No voice pronounced these words in Scrooge's ears, and yet he heard them when he looked upon the bed. He thought, if this man could be raised up now, what would be his foremost thoughts? Avarice, hard-dealing, griping cares, they have brought him to a rich end, truly. He lay in the dark, empty house, with not a man, a woman, or a child, to say that he was kind to him in this or that. And for the memory of one kind word, I will be kind to him, a cat was tearing at the door, and there was a sound of gnawing rats beneath the hearthstone. What they wanted in the room of death, and why they were so restless and disturbed, Scrooge did not dare to think. Spit it, he said. This is a fearful place. In leaving it, I shall not leave its lesson. Trust me. Let us go. Still the ghost pointed with an unmoved finger at the head. I understand you, Scrooge returned, and I would do it, if I could. But I have not the power, Spirit. I have not the power. 
again it seemed to look upon him. If there is any person in the town who feels emotions caused by this man's death, said Scrooge, quite agonized, show that person to me, spirit, I beseech you. The phantom spread its dark robe before him for a moment, like a wing, and withdrawing it, revealed a room by daylight, where a mother and her children were. She was expecting someone, and with anxious eagerness, for she walked up and down the room, <coughs> me, starting at every sound, looked out from the window, glanced at the clock, tried but in vain to work with her needle, and could hardly bear the voices of the children in their play. At length, the long expected knock was, her knock was heard. She hurried to the door and met her husband, a man whose face was careworn and depressed, though he was young. There was a mar remarkable expression in it now, a kind of serious delight, of which he felt ashamed, and which he struggled to repress. He sat down to the dinner that had been hoarded that had been hoarding for him by the fire. And when she asked him faintly what news, which was not until after a long silence, he appear, he appear, excuse me, he, he appeared embarrassed how to answer. Is it good? She said. Or bad? To help him. Bad. He answered, We are quite ruined. No, there's hope yet, Caroline. If he relents, she said amazed, there is. Nothing is past hope if such a miracle has happened. He is past relenting, said her husband. He is dead. She was a mild and patient creature, if her face spoke truly, truth. But she was thankful in her soul to hear it, and she said so with clasped hands. She prayed forgiveness the next moment, and was sorry. But the first was the emotion of her heart. What well, the half-drunken woman whom I told you of last night said to me, when I tried to see him and obtain a week's delay, what I thought was a mere excuse to avoid me, turns out to have been quite true. He was not only very ill, but dying then. To whom will our debt be transferred? I don't know. But before that time we shall be ready with the money, and even though we were not, it would be bad fortune indeed to find so merciless, merciless, sorry, merciless a creditor in his successor. We might sleep tonight with Lord Hots, Caroline. Yes. Soften it as they would, their hearts were lighter. The children's faces hushed and clustered round to hear what they so little understood were brighter. And it was a happier house for this man's death. The only emotion that the ghost could show him caused by the event was one of pleasure. Wow, that is what I call dark. Let me see some tenderness connected with a death, said Scrooge, or that dark chamber spirit which we left just now will be forever present to me. The ghost conducted him through several streets, familiar to his feet, and as they went along, Scrooge looked here and there to find himself, but nowhere was he to be seen. They entered poor Bob Cratchit's house, the dwelling he had visited before, and found the mother and children seated round the fire. Quiet, very quiet. 
the noisy little Cratchits were as still as statues in one corner, and sat looking up at Peter, who had a book before him. The mother and her daughters were engaged in sewing, but surely they were very quiet. And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. Where had Scrooge heard those words? He had not dreamt them. The boy must have read them out as he and the spirit crossed the threshold. Why did he not go on? The mother laid her work upon the table and put her hand up to her face. The color hurts my eyes, she said. The color? Ah, poor tiny Tim. The better now, again, said Cratchit's wife. It makes them weak by candlelight, and I wouldn't show weak eyes to your father when he comes home for the world. It must be near his time. Past it, rather, Peter answered, shutting up his book. But I think he's walked a little slower than he used these few last evenings, mother. They were very quiet again. At last she said, and in a steady, cheerful voice, that only faltered once, I've known him walk with... I've known him walk with Tawny Tim upon his shoulder, very fast indeed. So have I, cried Peter, often. So have I, exclaimed another. So had all. But he was very light to carry, she resumed, intent upon her work, and his father loved him so, that it was no trouble, no trouble. And there's your father at the door. She hurried out to meet him, and little Bob and his comforter, he had need of it, poor fellow, came in. His tea was ready for him by the hob, was ready for him on the hob, and they all tried who should help him to it most. Then the two young Cratchits got upon his knees and laid each child a little cheek against his face, as if they said, Don't mind it, father, don't be grieved. Bob was very cheerful with them and spoke pleasantly to all the family. He looked at the work upon the table and praised the industry and speed of Mrs. Cratchit and the girls. They would be done long before Sunday, he said. Sunday? You went today, then, Robert, said his wife. Yes, my dear, returned Bob. I wish you could have gone. It would have done you good to see how green a place it is. But you'll see it often. I promised him that I would walk there on a Sunday. My little, little child, cried Bob. My little child. He broke down all at once. He couldn't help it. If he could have helped it, he and his child would have been farther apart, perhaps, than they were. He left the room and went upstairs into the room above, which was lighted cheerfully and hung with Christmas. There was a chair set close beside the child, and there were signs of someone having been there lately. Poor Bob sat down in it, and when he had thought a little and composed himself, he kissed the little face. He was reconciled to what had happened, and went down again, quite happy. They drew about the fire and talked, the girls and mother working still. Bob told them of the extraordinary kindness of Mr. Scrooge's nephew, whom he had scarcely seen but once, and who meeting him in the street that day, and seeing he looked a little just a little down, you know, 
said Bob, inquired what had happened to distress him. On which, said Bob, said Bob, for he is the pleasantest spoken gentleman you ever heard, I told him. I am hardly sorry for it, Mr. Cratchit, he said, and hardly sorry for your good wolf. By the bar, how he ever knew that, I don't know. Knew what, my dear? Why, that you were a good wife, replied Bob. Everyone knows, everybody knows that, said Peter. Oh, hello there, Densua, welcome. We're in the middle of reading chapter four of A Christmas Carol. The ghost of Christmas yet to come. Very well observed, my boy, cried Bob. I hope they do. Hardly sorry, he said, for your good wife. If I can be of service to you in any way, he said, giving me his card, that's where I live. Pray come to me. Now wasn't, cried Bob, for the sake of anything he might be able to do for us, so much as for his con way, that this was quite delightful. It really seemed as if he had known our tiny Tim and felt with us. I'm sure he's a good soul, said Mrs. Cratchit. You would be sure of it, my dear, returned Bob, if you saw and spoke to him. I shouldn't be at all surprised, mark what I say, if he got Peter a better situation. Only hear that, Peter, said Mrs. Cratchit. And then, cried one of the girls, Peter will be keeping company with someone and setting up for himself. Get along with you, retorted Peter, grinning. It's just as likely as not, said Bob. All these days? Well, there's plenty of time for that, my dear. But however, and whenever we part from one another, I'm sure we shall none of us forget poor Tony Tim, shall we? Or this first parting that there was among us. Never, father, cried they all. And I know, said Bob, I know, my dears, that when we recollect how patient and how mild he was, although he was a little, little child, we shall not quarrel easily among ourselves and forget poor Tony Tim in doing it. No, never, father, they all cried again. I'm very happy, said little Bob. I'm very happy. Mrs. Cratchit kissed him. His daughters kissed him. The two young Cratchits kissed him, and Peter and himself shook hands. Spirit of Tiny Tim, thy childish essence was from God. Excuse me. Spectre, said Scrooge. Something informs me that our parting moment is at hand. I know it, but I know not how. Tell me, what man that was whom we saw lying dead? The ghost of Christmas yet to come conveyed him, as before. Though at a different time, he thought. Indeed, there seemed no order in these latter visions, save that they were in the future, into the resorts of businessmen, but showed him not himself. Indeed, the spirit did not stay for anything, but went straight on, as to the end just now desired, until besought by Scrooge to tarry for a moment. This caught said Scrooge. The which we hurry now is where my place of occupation is, and has been for a length of time. I see the house. Let me behold what I shall be in days to come. The spirit stopped. The hand was pointed elsewhere. The house is yonder, Scrooge exclaimed. Why do you point away? The inexor inexorable finger underwent no change. 
Scrooge hastened to the window of his office and looked in. It was an office still, but not his. The furniture was not the same, and the figure in the chair was not himself. The phantom pointed as before. He joined it once again, and wondering why and whither he had gone, accompanied it until they reached an iron gate. He paused to look round before entering. A churchyard. Here and then, the wretched man whose name he had now to learn lay underneath the ground. It was a worthy place, walled in by houses, overrun by grass and weeds, the growth of vegetation's death, not life. Choked up with too much burying, fat with repleted appetite. A worthy place. <coughs> Excuse me. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed down to one. He advanced towards it, trembling. The phantom was exactly as it had been, but he dreaded that he saw new meaning in its solemn shape. Before I draw nearer to that stone to which you point, said Scrooge, answer me one question. Are these the shadows of the things that will be? Are they the shadows of things that may be only? Still the ghost pointed, down, pointed downward to the grave by which it stood. Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends, to which, if persevered in, they must lead, said Scrooge. But if the courses be departed from, the ends will change. Say it is thus with what you show me. The spirit was immovable as ever. Scrooge crept towards it, trembling as he went and following the finger, read upon the stone of the neglected grave, his own name, Ebenezer Scrooge. Am I that man who lay upon the bed? He cried upon his knees. The finger pointed from the grave to him and back again. No, no, spirit! Oh, no! No! The finger still was there. Spirit! He cried, tight clutching at its robe. Hear me! I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been. But for this intercourse, why show me this if I am past all hope? For the first time, the hand appeared to shake. Good spirit, he pursued, as down upon the ground he fell before it. Your nature intercedes for me, and pities me. Assure me that I yet may change these shadows you have shown me by an altered life. The kind hand trembled. I will honor Christmas in my heart, and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Oh, tell me, I may sponge away the writing on this stone. In his agony, he caught the spectral hand. It sought to free itself, but he was strong in his entry and detained it. The spear, stronger still, repulsed him. Holding up his hands in a last prayer to have his fate reversed, he saw an alteration in the phantom's hood and dress. It shrunk, collapsed, and dwindled down into a bedpost.
And that was Chapter 4 of A Christmas Carol. Or Stave 4, as you want to call it. Whew. My, my. What a startling ending. Mm -hmm. Skeleton, woo! Yulia 20, bravo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ah. Well, now. Let's move on to the chat room, and we will discuss tonight's chapter and its adaptations. Hello there. Hello, hello, hello. Oh my goodness, I need to take a drink. Ah, that chapter has some of the more otter voices that I've done for it. <laughs> Old Joe especially is very hard for me to do. Very guttural. Mm. <laughs> that that scene alone is quite... Well, it's not as harsh as some of the other voices, but it's it's quite difficult. All right. So this chapter, this chapter is usually, as dear uh, Rizzo and Gonzo pointed out in um, A Muppet Christmas Carol, is probably one of the more serious and frightening ones. If there's any chapter in the entire story that does pattern itself after a ghost story, it's this one. All right, Maverick, you did well. Yulian 20, you do a good job. Oh, thank you. You're, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. You make me blush. Uh, so um, this one. I'm sure everyone who's seen adaptations of this chapter remember somewhat how spooky it is. Um, so yeah, most of the adaptations are pretty straightforward ones. I mean, as you can guess from the uh, description, the ghost in this one is patterned after death. And in fact, the chapter does hint at that. If you recall, Scrooge says he sees new meaning in its solemn shape. My guess is what they mean by that is that he sees at that moment that the shape represents death itself, or his death, as it were. Um, so adaptations of this. Like I said, there's not much difference between many of them. Um, usually it's just in a little bit of the content. Some of them remove the scene with um, the spirit showing him the couple who are delighted at his death. The 1984 one does a strange thing with it, I, if I recall. I'm trying to remember if that's true. They move that scene to... Ghost of Christmas Present, in a way, the couple scene. They change the entire context of the of the chat, but they move it to there. Unit 20, the Disney one is pretty intense. Ah, yes, the Disney one. The uh, one from the Jim Carrey film. I'm not sure how I feel about that one. That one is the closest you get to the ghost being depicted as a malevolent being, who is, while he's showing... Scrooge that future, he is basically out to scare him, hurt him, almost. Um, that one, they take an interesting... They took a lot of liberties in that one, and in fact, when the film was being made, if I recall, from what I had read, they had said ahead of time that they were going to take a lot of liberties with the Ghost of Christmas yet to come, and that scene. I'm not going to spoil it. They, um... If you want to see it, it, it's it's an interesting take, and it's incredibly frightening in some parts. Um, but I've never, f I'm not sure how I feel. Unit twenty. I saw once when the Guthrie Theater made the Ghost of Christmas Future. The writer Dickens. Oh, interesting. That's an interesting take. <laughs> Having the author take the place right there. Huh. That's interesting. Um, so, they were, where was, where was I? Oh, yes, yes, the, uh, the 1980, the, um, the Jim Carrey one, Disney one. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about the ghost being depicted as malevolent. As you saw in the last bits of this chapter, they do hint that the ghost actually does, for all his frightening demeanor, he does care about Scrooge. 
and he does show some compassion and mercy towards him. Um, what's kind of interesting, too, is that in the description itself, and in the illustration, unfortunately I don't have an example of the illustration, they depict the ghost with a human hand. He's basically depicted as one mass of like a dark cloak, but with a single human hand. And in, but in um, some adaptations, they go the full death motif, and they give him skeletal hands, which is actually which is sometimes kind of a neat thing, but it's also a bit on the nose at times for what he's supposed to represent. Um, there isn't much I can say about this, although I will say 1970s Scrooge, the musical one. They put in a full musical number. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was the nicest thing ever. Where literally the entire townsfolk dance on Scrooge's grave. Private Maverick in a Mickey Christmas Carol, Pete was the ghost of Christmas future and had spoken lines towards the end of the segment. Yes, and that is, I believe, one of the only adaptations which gives the ghost of Christmas yet to come, or ghost of Christmas future, I think they call him there. Um, any spoken lines. And again, they make him a bit malevolent in that version, too. Again, to be frightening. Um, yeah. Um, but uh, the odd thing with the musical version is it actually does kind of adapt a little bit of the novel in a way, because they are adapting in a manner of speaking the scene with the couple, only they're doing it a wider thing. They're showing that the only emotion anyone's feeling towards Scrooge in the future and his death is pleasure. I think also the 1970 musical is the only one that, one of the few that actually cuts out the whole Old Joe subplot. Um, which is interesting, because it is kind of an important little subplot to little scene in the story, since it shows, you know, what will happen to Scrooge after his death. There. Um, yes, it's, what was I, trying to think of what I was going here for, my dear scholars. <laughs> oh, my mind is wandering wide afield, it seems. Um, it, I'm trying to think, where was I? Help me, dear scholars, help me for where I am. Do any of you have a favorite um, adaptation of uh, this segment, by the way? Please feel free to uh, pipe in with your uh, memories of the Ghost of Christmas Yet to Come segments from A Christmas Carol. Cool skeleton. I lost my mind ages ago, so don't worry. <laughs> There's just not much to say. This um chapter is fairly straightforward. It's it's quite a thing to read. Um. Also, I think in the musical version they cut short the scenes with. Tiny Tim and and um, Tiny Tim's death. In fact, I think the musical version actually cuts the um, the whole segment fairly short down. Not as short as some versions. The nineteen thirty what was it? Nineteen thirty four version. I almost forgot that one. That one made the ghost of Christmas yet to come just a shadow. Which really works for it. Kintron, I'd say I played Ghost of Christmas Future, but it wasn't in the right play. More a cameo in a parody. Oh, that's interesting! That sounds really fascinating, actually. Well, that's cool. Ah. Oh, that must have been an interesting part to play. It, um, I mean, it would have to be, no, it would have to be an interesting part to play. Um, there isn't, yeah. 
But really, the um, someone once said that the whole point of Ghost Christmas Yet to Come is to basically scare Scrooge to the point that he um, finally learns the lesson. It hammers home the lesson to him uh, to change his ways. Oh wait, I forgot one. I I am so stupid, my dear scholars. I am so stupid. 1970s version, the Scrooge one. I forgot. There is a reason why they shorten it. They actually have Scrooge go to hell. I'm dead serious. We see him fall into hell, and we see him go to the afterlife and see what his fate will be. And it really is pretty intense. In fact, they bring back Marley for the scene for it. It is, yeah, it's pretty intense. It's an ironic hell, mind you. Alien 20. Ah, yes, the oily devil. <laughs> yes, they uh, breed out these, uh, these, um, executioner-type figures, and they just seem soaked with sweat, and it's just, yeah. It, it, that that scene is very, very, very intense for a Christmas Carol. You wouldn't expect it out of a, um, out of a musical version, honestly. The more I think about it, the more Scrooge is just a very good at, adaptation of, um, Christmas Carol. If you've never seen it, uh, go see it. It's really good. Um, but no, almost all of them are very, very straightforward takes on the subject, station wise So, let's see, well, I think we might make it a little bit of a short, shorter stream tonight. Mm. Save my energy up. It's been a long time. So let us talk about the future. Ooh. I apologize for that. That was goofy. Okay. So. You might be wondering when I'm going to do the final chapter of this story. I will be doing a special stream. Reading the last chapter of A Christmas Carol. On Christmas Day. Day. Yes, indeed, on Christmas Day, Christmas Day evening, there will be a stream by me of reading the final chapter of A Christmas Carol. It is the shortest chapter, so it might be a very short stream indeed. We'll see. I don't know if there's anything I can add to it. There's not much to discuss towards the redemption of Scrooge. Um, so afterwards, we'll, we'll talk about afterwards. I will be taking a week break after that Sunday stream. Um, I need a little bit of time to put together a plan for what's coming up next for our reading streams. I haven't chosen any yet. And also because these holidays are fairly stressful and fairly taxing, mentally taxing, um, even in the study. You might that might surprise you, you know. I am. You might think that the study itself, being in inter infinite library, cut off from the rest of the uh, multiverses and omniverses, omniverse, um, might be a safe place and you don't get stressed out. But no, we got plenty of things to stress out here. Horace can attest to that. So I will be taking a uh, week break from uh, the streams. But when we come back. We will continue with another gaming stream, and also with another reading stream. I haven't chosen what the reading stream is yet. It might be um, a new series of short stories, or it might be a novel. I haven't picked one just yet. So then, I think for now, though... We will close out this evening. And um, I see that uh, Sophia Ignace is streaming, so I think we will raid her tonight. Cool skeleton. She <laughs> shed. I'll need. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. Maybe something like that. Maybe. So, um, my dear scholars, 
I say unto you, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, till we meet again once more in the study. Take care, farewell, and I shall see you next time. Bye-bye.